Good morning and welcome back to CBC YouTube Edition. It is always a pleasure, as usual, to be worshiping with you wherever you might be. Let us uh, start this day with a prayer. Father, we come to you in praise and worship with all our hearts, our desires, and our sorrows. We ask that you touch each and every one of us, that we might be healed or consoled. In the name of Jesus, amen. Our first song is going to be from the hymn book, 376, if you have one at home. Must take you in and be more trusting to the 
This morning we are in our second week of a three-week detour from our study in 1 Timothy. And if you haven't done so already, I strongly urge you to either read, listen, or watch via our website the message from last Sunday. But once again this morning, I invite you to open up your Bibles to the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. It is the ninth book of the Bible. And as I shared last Sunday, 1 Samuel is a book of history. Generally speaking, the history of the Jews, but specifically the history of three main characters. The history of Samuel, of King Saul, and of King David. Now the book covers a period of 94 years from the birth of Samuel until the death of King Saul. So that we understand the context, 1 Samuel chapter 1 focuses on the birth of Samuel. Hannah, the soon-to-be mother of Samuel, she pours out her heart to the Lord regarding the fact that she is without children. And as the story unfolds, God graciously hears and answers her prayer. In fact, the name Samuel means ask of God. Now, after being weaned, we're told that Samuel is brought yearly back to celebrate that uh, answer of her prayer, brought back to the tabernacle. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, it begins with a beautiful prayer of Hannah, very similar to the prayer of Mary, the mother of Jesus, in Luke chapter 1. And Hannah, in fulfillment of her vow to God, surrenders her son to the service of the Lord under the care of the priest Eli. 
Now, although Eli's sons are wicked and disobedient to their calling, chapter 2 records Samuel's physical and spiritual growth. And the chapter concludes with the man of God coming and speaking a prophecy to the priest Eli. It is a prophecy of judgment, judgment against Eli and his family, but it is also a prophecy of hope, of hope for the nation of Israel. Last Sunday, our focus was on 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. And those 10 verses cover four calls of God and one request from Samuel. Four calls. The first is in verses 1 through 5, the second verses 6 and 7, the third in verses 8 and 9, and the fourth and final call of God is found in verse 10. But there's also one request, one life-altering, life-changing request from Samuel. He says in verse 10 of chapter 3, Speak for thy servant here. Other translations say, Speak for thy servant is listening. And in that brief prayer, we have such a fullness and completeness. We have the word speak, not a command, but a request. We have the word servant, speaking of the relationship between the two. And we have that word hear, which as I shared last Sunday, means to, to hear, to listen with the intention of responding. And so in this brief prayer, we have a request, we have a relationship, and a response. This morning, we want to look at the rest of the chapter, verses 11 through 21. Now, let me outline those verses. In verses 11 through 14, we have the message delivered by God. Verses 15 through 18, the message conveyed through Samuel. And then finally, in verses 19 through 21, the messenger honored by God. And so the message delivered by God, the message conveyed through Samuel, and the messenger honored by God. Let's turn our attention to 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 11. And the Lord said to Samuel, so verse 10, Samuel's request, speak for your servant, hear it, speak for your servant is listening. And so that's exactly what God, God does, verse 11. And the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I will do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of everyone that hear it shall tingle. Now, the King James doesn't do justice to what God is saying here. It's so shocking would this message be, this message against Eli and his family, that as one author describes, it would cause the ears of the people to ring like hammer blows on a bell. It's not this quiet tingling of a little bell, but rather such a shocking announcement as if hammer blows were on that same bell. He says, I'm going to do a work. He says, in verse 12, in that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. To what is he referencing? The prophecy for the man of God in chapter 2, verses 27 through 34. And why? Verse 13. For I told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. Where it says he's, his sons made themselves vile, literally his sons blasphemed God. Now, according to Levitical law, Leviticus chapter 24, his sons should have been stoned to death because of their behavior. And then at the end of that same verse, and because he, Eli, restrained the knot. Now let's be careful how we interpret and apply this particular phrase. Eli's sons were completely responsible for their own behavior. But 
Eli, as the priest and as their father, he knew the word of the Lord, and he should have intervened when he watched his sons blaspheme God, especially because they were in violation of their calling. Now, so serious is this, note verse 14, and therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity, the sin, the rebellion of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. Now, what is he saying here? Well, let me quote one author. He says, Eli's family was apparently guilty of presumptuous sin. For such defiant sin, there was no atonement. There was no amends. There was no forgiveness possible. And that the death penalty could be immediately applied according to Numbers chapter 15. Think about this. The fact that they were so vile in their blaspheming God, there would be no possibility for forgiveness. And, and here's Samuel asking God to speak to him, and this is the message he receives. The message delivered by God. His first divine encounter is a message of divine judgment. And then in verses 15 through 18, we see that message conveyed through Samuel. Verse 15, and Samuel lay until the morning and opened the doors of the house, or literally opened the doors of the tabernacle. Now, think about this. Samuel has just had a divine encounter with God. He has just heard the audible voice of God. And yet, his very next response is to, in all humility, fulfill his responsibilities in caring for the tabernacle. Now, if this happened today, I have to believe that a teenager hearing the divine, audible voice of God, probably their first response would be to post something on Facebook, probably make their friends aware via uh, Instagram, probably would have sought to be interviewed on Good Morning America or the Today Show or the Tonight Show. But what does Samuel do? Just fulfills his responsibility. Now granted, we're told he feared to show Eli the vision. And I appreciate that. Because this is an honest, emotional reaction. Because of an incredible first test for him as a prophet. Who wants to be the bearer of bad news? Especially news of impending judgment. Now, this may very well explain why many people do not want to hear the voice of God. I mean, think about it. The prophets, their role was to speak on behalf of God to the people. The prophet Jeremiah heard the voice of God. The result, he was cursed, mocked, beaten, and jailed. The prophet Hosea heard the voice of God, the voice that told him to marry a prostitute. The prophet Isaiah heard the voice of God, and he was told to walk around in minimal clothing for three years. The prophet Ezekiel heard the voice of God, and he was told to lay on his left side of his body for 390 days. I'm not saying God doesn't always make sense. What I am saying is, when we hear the voice of God, we need to be prepared to respond in obedience. Then Eli called Samuel and said, And Samuel, my son, and Samuel answered as he did throughout the chapter, near mine. And Eli says to him, What is the thing that the Lord has said unto thee? I pray thee, hide it not from me. God do so to thee, and more also, if thy hide anything from me 
of all the things that he said unto me. In other words, Eli says, tell me everything. Hold nothing back. In verse 18, and Samuel told him everything and did nothing from him. Complete, absolute obedience by Samuel. What a model for us. What an example for us. He was given an incredibly difficult message and he delivers it to the one who is going to be on the receiving end of God's judgment. In verse 18, at the end, Eli says, it is the Lord, let him do what seemeth him good. Even with all that he heard, he is resigned and submitted to the will of God. He knew the prophecy from chapter 2. He knew what was coming. But now it's upon him. Now in God's grace and in God's patience, the prophecy would be fulfilled 130 years later. And so Eli would not witness all the prophecy being fulfilled. But as the next chapters unfold, he would witness a part of it in the death of his sons. And so verses 11 through 14, the message delivered by God, verses 15 through 18, the message conveyed through Samuel, and then verses 19 through 21, the messenger, in this case Samuel, honored by God. Verse 19, and Samuel grew. I think we have the best pattern of growth in the life of Jesus. Luke chapter 2, verse 52, and it says, and Jesus grew in four areas, in wisdom, in his stature physically, in his relationship with God, in his relationship with men. So mentally, physically, spiritually, and socially. But note how God describes Samuel's growth in verse 19. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him. Now this phrase, the Lord was with him, that's a whole sermon in and of itself. It speaks of the divine presence of God. It is a unique experience of those in the Old Testament. In fact, if we back up to Genesis chapter 39, Genesis chapter 39, we're in the midst of the life of Joseph. Genesis chapter 39, verse 2, and the Lord was with Joseph. Verse 3, and his master saw that the Lord was with him. Verse 21, Genesis 39, speaking of Joseph, but the Lord was with Joseph. Verse 23, the Lord was with him. Four times in Genesis 39, it speaks of the Lord being with Joseph. Here we're told the Lord is with Samuel. A unique experience of those in the Old Testament, but it is to be a normal experience of those in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 28 in the Great Commission, it concludes in verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you only, even unto the end of the world. In the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, speaking of our relationship with Jesus, he will never leave us nor forsake us. So that which was unique and unusual in the Old Testament is to be normal in the New Testament. But is it? Does, does this describe your relationship with Jesus? Not just theologically, not because the Bible says it, but experientially. Do you sense that the Lord is with you day by day? If he is, then are we not to be hearing his voice? Just a thought. One that I will expound on more next Wednesday. 
Back to our text, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 19. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and he did let none of his words fall to the ground. The test of a prophet of God is simply this. 100% accuracy. Not 99%. A prophet of God is 100% accurate in his prophecies. We know that from Deuteronomy chapter 18. And as I said earlier, this prophecy of Samuel was fulfilled 130 years later. God's timing is perfect. But note this, anybody who seeks to speak on behalf of God must be 100% accurate. Because we're told in the Old Testament, if they were not 100% accurate, they are a false prophet and they are to be stoned. And so God honored Samuel. Verse 20, And all Israel from Dan to the north, even to Beersheba to the south, knew that Samuel was established to be the prophet of God. The boundaries of Israel from the north, where the tribe Dan would be, to the south, where the tribe Beersheba was. All of Israel would know that Samuel was a prophet of God. In verse 21, and the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, about 20 miles north of Jerusalem. Now, this is not just about geography, but this is a lesson for us to know that God is not limited by time or space when it comes to making himself real to us from his voice being heard by us. Yes, can God speak to us on a Sunday morning in a beautiful sanctuary? Absolutely. But God can speak to you in your living room. God can speak to you in your car on the way to work. God can speak to you while you're at the park watching your kids. Never limit where or when God wants to speak to you. So he appeared at the end in Shiloh. For the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. This word reveal means to manifest himself. Listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 14. He that keeps my commandments, or he that has my commandments and keeps them, he is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. So this is about obedience. And I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. I will reveal myself to him. Based upon what? Our obedience. The Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh based upon what? Samuel's obedience. And so in these last verses, verses 19 through 21, we have the prophet honored by God. Now, I don't want to give you too much from one chapter, but I can't help but share three lessons from Pastor Warren Wearsby uh, before I get into my particular application of this. Pastor Wearsby says three things. Do not underestimate the power of prayer in a family. We see that in Hannah and in Samuel. He says, do not underestimate the power of sin in a family. We see that sadly in the life of Eli. And he says to us, God speaks to the young, Samuel, and to the old, Eli, alike. So, three lessons from Pastor Warren Wiersbe. Now, as I reflect upon Samuel's request in chapter 3, verse 10, and what happens following his prayer, I'm reminded of the words of the Apostle Paul. Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. The biblical principle of sowing and reaping. It is the idea of cause and effect. Now, with that biblical principle of sowing and reaping, let's look at this story again, and let me outline it this way. Verse 10, God calls. Verse 10, Samuel prays. Verse 11, God speaks. Verse 18, Samuel obeys. Verse 19, 
God honors. That's a simple way of looking at this chapter. I can even simplify it further. Verse 10, prayer. Verse 18, obedience. Verse 19, presence. The presence of God. How's that for simplifying this incredible chapter? But, and as I shared last Sunday, it requires three things from us. First of all, it requires desire. Do we have a desire to hear the voice of God? Second of all, it requires discernment. Jesus said in John chapter 10, my sheep hear my voice. Do we, do we discern the voice of God above all other voices? Desire, discernment, and thirdly, discipline. Jesus said, if you love me, obey my commands. So, where do we go from here? Well, next Lord's Day, I want to bring this brief series to a close about hearing the voice of God. Now, at the risk of being repetitive, I want to continue to challenge you to pray the prayer of Samuel. To pray the prayer, speak for your servant here. Now, this was David's pattern in Psalm chapter 5. He says, my voice, David says to the Lord, my voice shall thou hear in the morning. And so I challenged you last week to pray this prayer daily. I'm going to up that challenge. Following the pattern of David, he says in Psalm 55, evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. So I'm challenging not only to pray in the morning but to pray at noon and to pray in the evening time. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Now just imagine what God can do in and through your life with that type of prayer. Just imagine what God can do in and through an entire congregation with that type of prayer. The praying that cries out to hear the voice of God. To pray the prayer that Samuel prayed. Speak, for your sermon is listening. Let's not just pray in the morning. Let's pray in the morning, in the noontime, and in the evening time. Let's follow not only the pattern of Samuel, but the pattern of David. A man after God's own heart. Let's pray. Father, my simple request is the request of Samuel. That you would speak to us because we as your servants are listening. And we're listening with the intent of responding. Not a delayed response, but an immediate response. I pray, Father, that is not only our prayer in the morning, but like David at the noon time, like David in the evening time. That our day is permeated with prayer and with the prayer that we would hear your voice. Lord, hear our prayer and answer it for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name.
let the words really touch with us as we walk with thee and trust in thee and have a relationship in thee. In Jesus' name, amen.